Well, good morning. Uh, as everybody takes their seats, now uh, if you have a copy of God's Word, you can open it up to John chapter 10. Uh, you can also see the scripture right there in front of you uh, in your worship guide. Um, a couple of things, a uh, couple of comments as, as introduction. My name is Jay Denton. Uh, some of you know me and others of you have never met me. I'm the campus minister for Reformed University Fellowship. Um, the denomination uh, that this church belongs to nationally is called the, the, the PCA, the Presbyterian Church in America. And so the PCA has a college ministry called Reformed University Fellowship, or RUF, or as any student that walks by a table we might have set up, what is rough? Um, and so uh, the way that our denomination works is that we, we call and ordain campus ministers, uh, teaching elders, uh, to go to campus, and, and it's a full-time job for me to do that. Um, just under 10 years ago, All Saints uh, decided they wanted to start an RUF at Boise State. And so this church, um, by its, its, its listening to the voice of God through prayer and through giving, enabled a campus ministry uh, of the PCA to be started on campus at Boise State. I'm the second campus minister. Some of you know Brian and Gail Fry. Brian Fry is the pastor of Boise Presbyterian Church, um, another ministry of All Saints. Um, that All Saints sent out a lot of people to go and plant that church, and that's where my family worships. Um, that's where students are worshiping. Uh, and so I just want to thank you for your investment. Uh, I want to remind you that you have a campus ministry on campus at Boise State. Um, whether you know the students' names or not, I want to invite you to pray for them, to pray for my wife and I and our family as we serve, to pray for our staff, um, and to know that the gospel's going forward on campus, um, more so than just with RUF, but through RUF, the Lord has been really gracious and generous. Um, we are seeing students come to know Jesus. We are seeing students come to church and find the beauty of that. Uh, and we are seeing real and, and beautiful and eternal growth because, um, because all saints has followed the good shepherd. Uh, and so just thank you for that. Um, I stand up here humbled uh, and appreciative of all that God has done through this congregation uh, and want you to know that. Um, let me read uh, from John chapter 10, uh, verses 11 through 18. Uh, this is Jesus talking. Um, this is uh, a sermonette, as one commentator uh, has said, um, about being a good shepherd. Uh, in the middle of John 10, starting in verse 11, going to verse 18, here's what it says. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees, the, the hired hand. He flees because he's a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold, and I must bring them also. And they will listen to my voice, so there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason, the Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. Let me pray. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, we do ask in the next few minutes as we unpack and consider your word to us, Lord, that you would be so kind to enliven our hearts. Lord, that you would take this room filled with goldfish and give us attention. Father, would you be so kind that in that attention where our hearts can, can listen and hear, Father, that you would change us? Lord, not by the power of a story um, or something funny that comes from my mouth, Lord, but by the power of the Holy Spirit that gives us new life. Lord, we trust you, we believe this, and that's why we sit here, and that's why I stand here, and that's why we read these words from your book. Lord, we need you, and we depend upon you, uh, and Lord, we pray that you would meet us here now. 
It's in your name we pray. Amen. Imagine this scene. A couple of years ago, uh, on an island um, out in the middle of uh, the Caribbean Sea, uh, there was a group of people. Now, when we normally think about a group of people in the Caribbean, we think, well, they must be having a good time. Why am I not there? I'm here in cold Idaho. But this group of people wasn't doing so great. This group of people was hungry. Uh, they didn't have enough shelter. And so people were fighting over where they would stay. The, the people were, were kind of left there. They didn't have a, have a way to get off the island. This group of people was in really bad shape. But it's not some third world picture that I want you to understand. It, it's a picture of people who, who have money, people who have affluence, people who have influence. You see, what they did is they bought a ticket for this thing called the Fire Festival. Maybe you've heard of it. They bought a ticket for the Fire Festival, and this festival was supposed to be a festival like none other. Really expensive, varying tiers of tickets where you could have everything you could ever dream of, music and food and culture and dancing and all this wonderful thing on this island in the Caribbean. And so hundreds and hundreds and thousands of people bought these tickets and they got on these planes and they went down and what they found was not the festival that they had paid for. They had found tents set up uh, on a partial island in a place that was not as pretty as was on the advertisements. What they found was not enough food. No, it wasn't gourmet food. It was a piece of white bread with a piece of American cheese on it. What they found was, was not at all what they thought they were going to have. Now, how did this happen? How do you convince seemingly intelligent, wealthy, or people who are willing to pay a lot of money, how do you convince people to come to an island to get something that, that's bad? Well, in our culture, there's a word for that. It's called influencers. You see, on social media, uh, on the Internet, there are people who make a living off of influencing other people. It has not worked for me. They set up their, their social media accounts and people follow them and they put up a, a shirt that they're wearing and guess what happens? Everyone goes and buys that shirt. They say that they really like this type of energy drink and guess what happens? Everybody goes and they buy that energy drink and so what the organizers of the fire festival did is they got with a bunch of influencers and they said, we're gonna, we're gonna pay you and we're going to let you come for free, and we want you to influence as many people as you possibly can. When I say millions of people, they were influencing millions of people. And so people started talking about this festival, and people started buying tickets to this festival. But the people who organized it couldn't produce there's a documentary about it, and it's just a cacophony of errors from start to finish, mismanagement of money, securing a location. Yet for whatever reason, because these influencers had started this tidal wave of influence, this thing wasn't going to stop. And so that's why we have this group of people stranded on an island with not enough place to sleep and not enough food. And guess where the influencers were? Not there. <laughs> they decided not to go. They found out that it wouldn't be what they thought it was going to be. They ran as fast as they could because they had no buy-in. They had no care for these people. Where were the organizers of this, quote, festival? They were running around, and at some point, many of them just threw up their hands, and they walked away because they didn't really care about these people. They played the blame game, and lawsuits happened, and as you watch this documentary about the fire festival, here's what you hear over and over again. It wasn't my fault. It wasn't my fault. I mean, it was somebody else's fault. The blame game, pushing any type of accountability away from them. This is not the picture of the good shepherd we see. Instead, this is the picture of our hearts, isn't it? That as sinners in need of grace, we are the influencers, whether it be in our family, in our community, in our church. We might not have millions of people following us, but if you're anything like me, and I think you are, you know that, that, that each and every day you can influence for good and you can influence for evil, and, and, and it piles on us, doesn't it? 
and we look at the, the mirror at the end of the day and we know that we haven't owned all that we should have, thankfully we have a good shepherd. Thankfully we have a, a picture of what is good. When I look in verses 11 and, and 14 and 15, what we see is that the work of Jesus is good. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd in verse 11. Now, the, the Pharisees, the religious elite, those people who knew it all, the people who were self-righteous, they saw shepherds as a part of an unclean profession. I grew up in a church that had a picture of a shepherd and a sheep behind the pulpit. And I'm sure it was much prettier than actually the work of a shepherd with the dust and the dung and all the things that, that make it dirty. Rich people saw shepherds as a lower class of servant. You know, perhaps the, the modern day shepherd, we could compare to a trash collector. Think about how trash collectors are viewed. Maybe there's one or two in this room. Have you ever felt uh, like someone viewed you as dirty or poor or smelly? But think about not just the service they provide, but the protection that a trash collector brings. You know, I've got friends who are missionaries in third world countries, and they talk about how there's no system in some of these governments to take the trash away, and so the trash piles up. And as the trash piles up, the critters come in, and disease begins to spread, and it, and it does smell. There's no system of removal in these places. Think about how unclean it is without the trash, trash collector. Those who collect our trash, they show a love for neighbor that most of us should aspire to. Think about that. The wages that a trash collector makes and the service they provide, it shows a love of neighbor. I take my trash and I put it in my bin and it goes away and my house doesn't have to smell and I don't have to do anything to get rid of it. Jesus is saying in a sense in verse 11, I am the good trash collector. He takes all of our filth, all of our sin, all of our brokenness, and he takes it away so that we can live in the fullness of a clean and cleared conscience. So that we can live in the clarity of forgiveness. This is the center of this passage today. That Jesus is our substitute that Jesus takes our sin so that we can have forgiveness and perfection. His work is good. Jesus is a good shepherd. This idea of good in this text is not Jesus saying, I'm really good at being a shepherd. Now, don't get me wrong. Jesus is really great at being our God, okay? We would say perfect. He perfectly upholds all things by the word of his power. In perfect providence, Jesus is a good God. But this passage is not just saying that Jesus is good at his job. But good in the sense of being, of quality, of ideal. Another way to hear uh, Jesus is to hear him say, I am the kind of shepherd that you should emulate. I'm the kind of shepherd that you should follow. I'm the kind of shepherd that you should live your life following. What does it mean to follow Jesus? Well, in this passage, as we see in, in verses 14 and 15, it means that we live in, in sacrifice as we follow him. He's the good shepherd. I lay down my life for the sheep, he says at the end of verse 15, that we too must give our lives. Now let that sink in for a second. I want us to consider what it looks like for us to give our lives. Because we live in one of the best cities in America. That's what all the magazines say. That's why somebody's like, are you moving to Boise? I'm like, yeah. Of course I am. Why wouldn't you, right? We're called to live and follow him in sacrifice, to give our lives. You know, um, a, a few years ago, I took a group of students 
from, from the ministry that I worked with prior to being out here. I took him to, to London, um, which sounds awesome. Uh, and we got on a train and we went to West London, which is uh, m- uh, mostly made up of people from uh, Southeast Asian communities. Um, and, and there's a small group of churches, and all the churches are small. Probably all the churches, if you added up every single one, um, would not equal the people in this room. But gospel ministry is going forth. It's beautiful. They kept talking about how they wanted to be family in their churches. Um, and how each Sunday they worship in the evenings. Um, maybe even right now they're worshiping. And soon they will all gather for a meal together at their respective churches. And, and as, a, as a pastor, as someone who loves like developing people and communities and ideas, I thought, man, isn't that just so awesome? They eat together every single week. It's really neat. It's a great idea. Maybe how can we implement some of that, right? I'm just thinking about all this, you know, high-level stuff. How can we create community? But, but, but here's the reality in these Southeast Asian London communities. It's not just a great idea for them. It's not just something that they, they do because they like eating together. It's a necessity for them. Because when people leave Islam or Hinduism or Sikhism in, the, in these communities, their family shuns them. Their family no longer welcomes them around their table. They don't have dinner with them anymore. These men and women and children, they lose something when they, when they follow Christ. And so these churches welcome them into family How are you following the noble, the quality, the ideal shepherd? Some more questions. How are you living in sacrifice towards him? Are you really living to follow Jesus, his word, and his calling on on your life? Or are you making your faith something that you're deciding? One of those things is Christianity, and one of those things is not Christianity. How do we live in light of the sacrifice of Jesus? Now, let's stop here. I actually don't think it's, it's us leaving today going, I'm gonna be more radical for Jesus. I actually don't think that's what the Bible is calling us to do. To take everything on ourselves and tomorrow morning, like we say in the Southeast, go fight hell with a water pistol, right? I don't think that's what the scripture is saying. I actually think it's calling us to live a normal and everyday life where Jesus is not just first in our life, but where Jesus, like yeast and dough, gets into every corner of our life. I've got a friend back on the East Coast. His name is Will. Will's from California, comes from a Christian home, and got fed up with institutional Christianity a few years ago. And so he got in his car like any 20-year-old should do, and drove across the country with no plan. (laughs) It was great. Did it for Jesus. Will showed up to a church that um, that I preached at occasionally, and uh, he started coming to RUF, and we started getting to know him, and, and he was mad at the church. He was angry because all he saw were people who were just doing ordinary things and nobody was really following Jesus and sacrificing. And he gave up everything as a 20 year old and drove across the country to give up his whole life for Jesus. And I looked at him and I said, man, you didn't do anything special. And like, it was almost as if I dropped an uh, atomic bomb on him because he was offended because he heard me say, actually, Will, what you did was really easy. Why don't you go spend an afternoon watching what a stay-at-home mom does? Why don't you go to work with someone who's trying to, to be ethical and follow Jesus in their life, and it's hurting their career because they're choosing not to lie, cheat, and steal? Go sit in the office with them, Will. And you could see this reality hit Will in the face. Now, Will is a deacon at his church. Will still lives a life for Jesus. He works for a a, a great company. He takes homeless guys out to breakfast and gets to know them. 
But each and every day, he's living a much more normal life for Jesus. Not this take off and go anywhere and do anything, but he's staying where he is. He's planting roots. You know, I think this is what it looks like for us to live radically for Jesus. Now, if God's messing with you today and he's calling you to be a foreign missionary, don't listen to me, okay? I want you to go. I want the Holy Spirit to give you the freedom to say, I'm called to leave this place and to go somewhere else. And that is you ordinarily following the Holy Spirit, okay? Don't let my words keep you from going to the nations. But please let my words punch you in, 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 in the heart, knowing that each and every day we have an opportunity to get up and live sacrificially exactly where we are. Jesus says in verses 14 and 15 that I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me just like the Father and I know each other. That's a pretty big statement. That his sheep, that his followers, that those of us in this, in this room who are Christians, that, that we can know Christ and his resurrection like the Father knows Christ. Jesus compares our relationship to him like he's talking about the Trinity because we have intimacy with Christ. What you heard earlier this morning is that, that our God is imminent and that our God is transcendent. Do you know what I tell my students? I say that God is big and God is close. That God is big and that God is close. And because of that, we can have intimacy with him. The fact that he is big, that he is powerful, that he is holy, that he is in charge and that he loves us and chooses to be close to us is the best news because he knows our sin and our brokenness and our failure and he doesn't run away. He doesn't cast us aside. He doesn't push us away. That's not the picture of the good shepherd. The picture of the good shepherd is that he is here and that he is mighty and that he's gentle. We have intimacy with Christ because he's laid down his life He's opened the door for us to have that. This isn't about shame. It isn't about guilt. In Christ, our guilt is taken away and our shame is put on him. In Christ, we have freedom to lay down everything that we want for the sake of others and to know Jesus better. In a couple of Thursdays, we're going to take a group of freshman students out to a restaurant called Big Judd's. Maybe you've been there. I've never been, so it'll be my first experience too. One of our freshmen, his name is Josh. He's from uh, Vancouver, Washington. Um, he comes up to me. He's a big dude. Like He's tall. He can eat a ton of food. He comes up to me, and he's like, so, um, so at Big Judd's, there's this, there's this two-pound hamburger challenge, and I really want to do it. <laughs> I was like, okay, that sounds awesome. He's like, but I don't have a whole lot of money. And if I can't eat this hamburger, it's going to cost me like $30. Like, would, you, would you pay for half if I don't eat it? And I said, bro, that's awesome. <laughs> this is what I do for a living, okay? <laughs> I said, bro, that's, I said, I'll pay for all of it if you don't eat it. Like, I'm on your side. I've seen you eat pizza. I believe in you. <laughs> I said, I'll pay for all of it if you don't eat it. Just get in there and do your best. Next time I preach, I'll report back on what happened. Okay? <laughs> and as silly as it sounds, Josh's face, it went from this like sheepish, kind of like, I want to do this, but I don't know how. It went to this like joyful, free face. He was like, really? Like, like, like really? Like I can go and do this and I don't have to fear having to pay the $30? No, man, I got you. He's so excited. <laughs> Jesus will pay for you to eat the two pound hamburger. What is it like for you to embrace that childhood excitement that Josh feels? To go out, whether you fail or not, you know that your sins are forgiven, 
that your God, your shepherd, is calling you to live sacrificially, to give like you've never given, to love, to take a deep breath and go back into the kid's room who's just screamed at you and to meet them with kindness, to go to work fearing that you'll be fired and to say no when someone asks you to chill and see, uh, uh, well, hopefully you chill at work, Cheat still or lie. You see, we have nothing to fear because Jesus is not just good at his job. He is good and he calls us to follow him. And we can trust him. And every single time it's worth following the good shepherd in the sacrifice because his works are good. You know, it's also true that his patience is good. We see this in verses 12 and 13. Two, two kind of hard verses, especially if we use them as a mirror, where it says, he who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. In these verses, there's this picture of someone who's been employed, someone who's been hired, who's not the shepherd, um, uh, not the shepherd who gives his life to guard the sheep. It's a hired hand that's just collecting a paycheck and wants to hang out on the side of a mountain and daydream while the sheep eat. Maybe this person thought, that sounds like a really great job. Right, I get to be outside, I get to make money. And all is fine until a threat comes in. I think it's interesting here in the, the scripture, it, it actually says, when he sees a wolf coming. It doesn't say when the wolf attacks it says when he sees a wolf coming, he leaves. And because he leaves, the wolf snatches the sheep. You, you kind of need to picture the, the National Geographic or the BBC TV show here. The wolf grabs them by the neck, chomps down on them. And, and I don't want to be too graphic here, but I, but I want you to understand what the scripture is, is saying here. That the, wolf, the, the, the sheep actually scream that harm is being done, that hurt is happening. The other sheep, they don't fight back. They're confused. Have you ever seen that happen? Right? Maybe it's a cheetah chasing after antelope, and they scatter, and they run. They're confused. They're scared. They're more susceptible to the other wolves in the pack because wolves hunt together. The hired hand flees because the Bible says he cares nothing for the sheep. He cares so little that they'll suffer death, and he moves on to the next thing. It's a really hard picture to see. You see where I'm going with this. You, you see the reality of life in a church community. We just, we just installed a new elder who's called an under-shepherd. You see why Phil talked so, so warmly about his experience with with under shepherds? Because shepherds care for the sheep. Jesus cares for us so that we can care for others. The life of Christ is anything but a picture of a hired hand. Think about the life of Jesus. He stood up for the oppressed, the marginalized of society. He elevated the status of women in a society that saw them as second class. He gave hope to prostitutes, to crooked tax collectors, and to all who came to a point where they realized they had to lose their life to gain an eternal one. So what does it look like for us? What does it look like for us to, to do this? Well, one, it's because his patience is good that we can consider it. You know, in a sense, we're always looking out for ourselves but if we see those around us or us ourselves who are living an easy Christianity and we don't really have to sacrifice anything for it, we've got to consider that something's not right, that something's off, that, that, that those who are living an easy Christian life will leave us, that they don't really care about us. Or if we are living an easy Christian life on the side of the hill, then we will be leavers. It's kind of a bold statement to say that. 
You know, I, I'm saying that, that people who claim to be Christians yet choose to live an easy, breezy, breezy faith and never sacrifice for goodness, truth, and beauty, well, we are the hired hands. Maybe another way to say it is that we all are the hired hands, aren't we? That we have the Spirit and we understand our failures. But what does it look like to be a hired hand? You know, I wonder if it looks like apathy. I wonder if it looks like being physically present but spiritually absent. I wonder if it looks like getting to the, to the end of your rope and not being willing to sacrifice and just letting things happen. You know, if, in, in, in our college group, I would say to the students, if you're being asked by those that, that claim they want to be your friends, your brothers, your sisters, to do things that deplete your dignity, they do not care about your personhood. In, in college, it's almost more active, isn't it? Hey, come do this with us. Come be this with us. Come say this with us. But in the church, it's more uh, of, a, of a passivity that ignores dignity, I think, sometimes. Are you calling people to follow you or Jesus? Are you claiming to be a Christian, yet uh, your reflection is so much closer to a hired hand or a wolf? Are you calling people to follow you so that uh, you can get your desires met, your comforts increased, and your social status improved? Or are you pointing people to Jesus? These are just good, hard questions for us to ask. It's, it's supposed to be heavy, right? But not heavy without hope. That's why every single week we confess our sins. And we hear, after we confess our sins, an assurance of pardon. That it's good for us to feel the weight of our sin, but to rely on the patience of God with us. His patience is good. And finally, his promises are good. We see this in verses 16 through 18. You see, apart from Christ, like I'm a wolf, right? Uh, if I'm honest about myself and my history, I want glory and influence so that I can get what I want. And whether that's notoriety or good job, Jay, or whether it's a comfortable life, Apart from Christ, I'm a destructive influencer, a destructive leader, because ultimately, I will look out for number one. When I see the wolf, I will run because I want comfort and control. I want to be admired. I want people to serve me. But Jesus is more qualified than any other to call me to change and to give me the power to do it. I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. Jesus says that he's got other sheep, and that they're going to hear his voice. That Jesus promises us that he is going to work. And that it's not my voice, that it's his voice. He promises that he will grow his church. Jesus actually sets before us this morning a picture of what a sure hope is in verse 16. A hope that we can take to the bank. Not a hope that, that I hope Jesus will do something. No, a hope that we can put our faith and our trust in because it will happen. The promises of God are not just a, con a convenient tool to make ourselves feel better, though we do find great comfort in them. The promises of God are not just something that we know to be true, but that we can't truly know because we're so low and he's so high. No, we can know his promises. The promises of God are sure. Jesus died. Jesus was raised. Jesus will come again. That's what we read about in verses 17 and 18. That he has the authority to lay down his life and to pick it back up again. Jesus died. And to many it seems odd that God would need to die on a cross. But friends, the story doesn't end there. 
Jesus laid down his life because he is the good shepherd. He laid down his life on the cross to rescue us from sin and death and so that we can take our wolf costumes off and join in the flock so that we can follow him in loving and serving and giving up our lives for others. Perhaps you find yourself now as a person who's been cared for by hired hands who care nothing for you. Come to the good shepherd who will be patient with you, who will restore your wounds. Perhaps you find yourself now as a person who has been devoured by wolves, barely hanging on to your dignity. Come to the good shepherd who will restore your life. Perhaps you're a wolf or you're a hired hand who causes sorrow, pain, and death with a belief that you are smarter and wiser than the one who created you, even you. Come to the good shepherd, lose your power, become a sheep. Come to the good shepherd who will change you and give you new life that you may give new life to others. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd and he is indeed good. Let me pray. Father, thank you that your Holy Spirit is far greater than any influencer that we could ever follow on social media. Lord, that while social media, while the things of this world, they cry out to our hearts to be desirous and envious and to want more things, Lord, your Holy Spirit sees our hearts. You fill our hearts. Lord, you give us a hope and a future. You are the good shepherd. God, I pray that we would be reminded of that today as we commune with you, as we sing, and as we leave this place. It's in your name we pray. Amen.